Welcome back to the Discovering Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Our guest today is the Chief Sales Officer and Partner at Besson Partners, Ron Cohen. Ron, it's a pleasure having you on today. Thanks again for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So Ron, before we start, could you walk us through your story in commercial real estate and how you got started? Sure. Uh, so commercial real estate brokerage is actually a second career for me. Um, I had uh, started my career in, in the advertising agency world as uh, an account management type of, uh, type of role. Um, I kind of got to the point in, in there where I just decided it was too much BS for too little money and fell in love with commercial real estate and uh, made the pivot into investment sales. Um, I landed at Besson and uh, I've been there pretty much uh, the entirety of my career with uh, the exception of a one year stint at what was Eastern Consolidated uh, where I met some terrific sharp people as well and learned over there too. And uh, I ultimately boomeranged back to Besson in a, in a, like a managerial kind of role that was created for me uh, where I was overseeing marketing which ultimately uh, evolved into my current role as head of sales and, and ultimately the brokerage. So um, I run the shop and I originate and execute business as well. Got it. Okay, understood. And what do you think um, drew you into investment sales brokerage when you first started? You know, when you decide on a career in real estate sales, or real estate in general, you have, you know, you have a few decision criteria to make, right? So I, I think the first one is, do I want to go residential or do I want to go commercial? Mm. Uh, and that was an easy one for me. Although I would say what really truly piqued my interest in the business was just reading the real estate section of the Sunday Times every Sunday and just kind of drooling over all the fantastic New York real estate. Right. Um, but uh I spoke to a few people and whom, whom I respected and uh, decided that commercial real estate and investment sales was, uh, was really for me. Um, I liked the fact that it was more of an investment type of decision uh, rather than so subjective about so many things. Uh, and it just completely changed my perspective walking around New York City and looking at all these buildings. Got it. Okay, great. And what do you think you'd be doing career-wise if not commercial real estate? Uh, probably still be in advertising, advertising? Okay. I would say, um, you know, I was passionate about that business for a while. It's a, it's a nice mix of creativity and marketing. Uh, and in my role, I was client facing. So I really, you know, developed that kind of mentality, uh, which stays with me to, to this day. I mean, it's, it's really all about the client. Um, you know, if you were to ask me what might my dream job might be, uh, I might say being a curator at, at MoMA okay. or, or possibly uh, an art dealer. Awesome. That's great. Um, and, and how did you learn the skills associated with being a leader? Is this something that you were born with or did you develop this along, along the way? I, I think it's, it, it, it's certainly somewhat innate, although uh, a, lot, a lot really learned along the way. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with and observe a number of uh, executives in, you know, in, in my time in, in business. And, uh, you know, I would say, you, you know, you need to stay true to your core values. Um, I'm the type of leader that uh, really is, manages from the bottom up and am supportive of, of people in their growth and development and want them to come along with me. Uh, I think that, you know, leading by fear and bossing people around mm. is no longer effective. Got it. Oh. And what is the learning curve in commercial brokerage? Um, how long does it take for a broker to really get it and be able to kind of originate and close on their own deals? Yeah, that, that does vary by individual. Uh, typically, we, you know, we say the first year is all about building your foundation and, you know, and learning and you should expect not to necessarily close a sale until the end of your first year to manage people's expectations. Uh, you know, that said, I've seen, I've seen people come in and put a, put, put a, a, 
a deal under contract in in six months. Uh, you know, so it it really it really does vary by individual. Uh, frankly, it you know it could take two to three years or so to to really kind of get it, mm. as you say, uh, because it's important to go through the process of a sale transaction and everything that comes along with that and all the twists and turns along the way uh, to, to, to fully have that perspective and be able to execute independently. Okay, got it. And do you think a broker should be starting out as an analyst or should they move directly into origination? So, I mean, it certainly sounds good in theory to start as an analyst and spend a year or two doing that and then, uh, you know, and then move into a, a, a brokerage role. And again, I, I would say it really d- depends on the individual. Okay. Uh, and I've just found in my experience with a lot of different people that they're two different personality types, mm. right? An analyst versus a broker. Um, so uh, they don't always necessarily coincide. When someone has the right personality, and just that that spark, uh, no reason to hold them back and not not you know get them going and prospecting and uh, in a, in a sales kind of role. In okay. my opinion, got it. And as far as like when you do business with other brokerage shops and other brokers uh, brokerage firms, how do you kind of maintain good relationships to encourage future business? Uh, a number of ways. Um, you know, for, for one, I I would I would say by being above board in in any and all of your dealings with you know with 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 outside brokers, uh, if you say you're gonna give a broker a shot at a deal, give him a real shot. Right. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, just just like client relationships, it takes some time and in investing in you know in in the relationship to you know have lunch or a drink or a coffee or you know or whatever. Um, I you know I. We'll get together from time to time with uh, with with friends in in, in the brokerage community, and uh, you know. But actually, the the real answer, the ultimate answer, is do a deal together, right? Because that that puts it on another level. And once once you've done that, you've had the the experience of working together, obviously, and there's a built in trust. Mm. So then you know, then then the next phone call and next opportunity is is a much easier conversation and you've kind of worked through that stuff already. You know, John, there's actually a sizable uh, community of, of, of Besson alumni out there who, uh, who I still remain friendly with to this day and certainly happy to, to work with, uh, you know, in any given deal opportunity. Uh, at, uh, it's funny because I would, I would say that Besson has been Probably the largest incubator of boutique independent shops in uh, in investment sales in New York City, besides Massey Knackle. Mm, wow, awesome! And um, Ron, I want to know what do you think is the secret to effective negotiation? Mm. Uh, again, uh, this there there are books upon books written on this too, right? Uh, so you know, it's it's a it's a multi it's a multifaceted answer. Um, you know, I mean, every successful negotiation has to be a win-win, right? Except I like to win a little more. <laughs> uh, you know, you want the other side uh, walking away feeling like they got a fair deal, so they'll do business with you again, got it. right? Um, other things I would, I would add is just to say that, uh, you know, you certainly want to... Uh, as, as an intermediary in the transaction like we are, uh, remember who you're representing, mm. right? Um, and conversely, know who you're no- negotiating with so you can effectively communicate with them in a, you know, in, in a way that's going to move the needle. Uh, other thing I would say is listening is of tad amount importance, mm-hmm. which sounds like a super basic thing to say, but so many people are, you know, are already thinking in their mind and on to the next thing to answer the question they're right. anticipating versus actually listening to what's being said right. or hearing what they want to hear, um, which, which muddies the waters a little bit. Got it. And uh, when it comes down to the skill set of, you know, being a good listener and being a good intermediary, 
how how would you say how would you recommend for young people to kind of go about building this skill set up? Hmm, that's a that's that's a good question. Uh, I mean, it's really you know it it it's really just just practice. I mean, um, you know, you can. I don't know about if there's any kind of courses or any anything you you can take, uh, but that's just a, a you know a practiced skill that you have to be conscious of. I don't you know, that's I I, I don't have any other sage sage advice on that. Got but, it. But it's an important skill, as basic as it sounds. Right. Definitely. Um, okay. And let's say that there's a young real estate entrepreneur watching this right now mm-hmm. who wants to go out there and start their firm. Would you recommend that they, you know, work at a big shop for a couple of years, get a couple of years of experience and connections, or should they just start their own firm directly out of college and kind of learn as they go? Do not jump right into starting your own firm. In in my in my opi- opinion, uh, I I think it's really important to have mentors uh, and really learn from experienced, worldly wise people who have had time in the market and know what they're doing. Uh, particularly in brokerage, there's, there's just a lot of nuances. Um, you know, it's not rocket science as, as some people have said, but there, you know, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of pitfalls and landmines along the way that when you don't have a track record of deal experience that you've been through, you don't, you don't know exactly how to navigate those, right. those, those waters. So, um, it's it's very important to to go and learn from learn from people who know what they're doing first, uh, and I would say you know companies like CBRE and JLL are are world class, though you would likely have a more hands on experience at a boutique shop like ours, mm. where you really roll up your sleeves, uh, get into a transaction and be part of it, and uh, and earn keep a lion's share of what you earn too. Got it. So it's it's very important to kind of starting out, get that exposure um, on all facets of the deal before you kind of jump in and lead a deal. Hundred percent. I mean, you really it, it's 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 entirely necessary. And you know what? I mean, you learn something new on every deal. Mm. I, I still do, and that that is something that uh, that that really drives me and fulfills me working working in this business. Mm. And you gotta you gotta you gotta be open to that. And you also have to be smart enough to understand that you don't know everything and there's a lot to learn. Got it. Okay. And as far as um, setting goals for yourself and for your team and for your company, how do you kind of go about this process? So for myself, I, you know, I I write down uh, both personal and professional goals for myself every year. Uh, I, I have a little pet peeve about New Year's resolutions. Uh, I just I think that those are very short term thinking, and most people abandon them within a month or two. Um, so I really always think in terms of goals and goal setting. Um, so you know, as far as the team is concerned, uh, we you know we do a we do a, a beginning of year goal planning meeting uh, and talk about you know obviously like numbers goals, but but other learning and uh, tactical goals to support uh, and drive the train to you know to achieve their financial mm. goals. Uh, we will typically uh, review mid mid year on you know on progress and how they're doing, and and as well as at the end of the year. Um, and you know there's there's certainly feedback and coaching along the way, mm. and uh, you know that's 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 important. Got it. Okay, and. When you're dealing with pitfalls or struggle, um, how what kind of what kind of a um, mindset do you take towards it? Do you avoid it or do you embrace it? Getting deep now, John. <laughs> I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the uh, the therapy couch here. <laughs> um, it, it, in, in seriousness, I I very much embrace it. Um, you know, my my background, as I was sharing with you a little bit before, I'm a kid from Queens, came from modest beginnings. Uh, you know, went to public school, uh, started working at age 12 from like a paper route in the neighborhood to, you know, to working in retail, fast food, waiting tables at mm. restaurants, 
Um, I paid for the, you know, my, my clothes on my own back uh, when I was a kid and, uh, you know, worked my way through college, paid for a portion of my college too. Um, in my 20s, uh, I, I worked uh, full time and went to school part time for four years to, to get an MBA, mm. um, which I covered myself. And so, uh, you know, to, to me, uh, I'm, I'm proud of the hard work that, that I've done to, to get to where I am. And so uh, that, that drives me to this day. And I, and I still think that I've got more work to do mm. and I can be better. And I, I firmly believe that anyone who hasn't experienced some, some struggle in their lives just doesn't have the fire in the belly necessary to succeed in, in our business, in mm. brokerage at least. Got it. Okay. So you kind of take this mindset where even if something negative would come up, you would take it as learning experience and kind of grow and adapt from it. 100%. You have to, you know, you, sometimes we all have to take our lumps and, uh, you know, and then dust your shoulders off and right. get back up and keep going, keep going. Right? right? It's, 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 it's all about that. Particularly in, you know, in, in brokerage where, um, listen, there, you know, there, there can be some crushing moments where you think you, you have a deal that's going to close and you know you're you're thinking about the the deposit in in your bank account and you know and it goes away and you know and maybe that's that's sometimes because some some someone has done something shady mm. um and that can be tough but you just you really have to you know go go home and 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 cry about it for uh for a day or so and then just like pick your head up and and keep keep moving forward Got and it. You know, if you don't have that kind of resiliency, this is not a good business to be in. Got it. Understood. Okay. Um, and I want to ask for your perspective on um, certain neighborhoods within New York City. So what neighborhood do you think has the most potential right now in the city? <clears throat> you know, I thought about that for a few minutes and then it just like hit me like a ton of bricks. The answer, in my opinion, is Gowanus, okay. Brooklyn. Um you know, I, I, I actually lived in Carroll Gardens, just, uh, I guess, west of there for, for four years, which I loved. I'm a big, uh, big fan of Brooklyn. And, um, you know, it was no man's land way back when I, when I lived there, uh, kind of, you know, in between neighborhood, between Carroll Gardens and Park Slope with a bunch of gas stations and auto repair shops and industrial buildings and, you know, and, and, the, and the dirty Superfund site, the Gowanus Canal, right? right? Um, but, you know, after 10 long years of discussion and back and forth, it finally got rezoned in 2021. And, uh, you know, and now there's, I believe, 8,500 units or so uh, to be built mm -hmm. and like a million and one square feet uh, un currently under development. So that's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and what is even more kind of astonishing is that developers were paying $350 per buildable square foot right. for, for, for land there pre-approval in anticipation of the rezoning, which is, which takes some guts. Mm. That's, that's risky. Got it. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's going to be incredible. There's waterfront there, right? I mean, you know, waterfront is, is, is golden. Uh, I mean, there was, there was a Whole Foods there that, you know, when I guess Lightstone was the pioneer in that neighborhood to, to build a residential building with, with a Whole Foods in it. And everyone was like, wow, wait a second, Whole Foods by the Superfund site, Gowanus Canal. So, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in that neighborhood. I also want to like, I guess probably shout out to Long Island City too, okay. because, uh, you know, that, that, that neighborhood has also, uh, blossomed incredibly in, uh, you know, I mean, for really over the past decade, but more recently you've started to see more infill there in terms of like retail and amenities to help it grow and develop as, a, as an actual neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it still has a lot of runway. Okay, great. And um, how do you think investors should go about kind of determining what neighborhood is going to be poised for growth in the future? What, what kind of factors do you think they look at? Um, transportation access is, is typically number one. Mm 
you know, like just as, as an example, uh, you know, certain neighborhoods in Queens along the seven line, uh, you know, really saw a boost in, in the past number of years, like Sunnyside and Woodside, uh, you know, so that's, that's typically, uh, you know, typically something, um, you know, and also historically just, you know, where, where, you know, where artists and creatives have kind of popped up, right? Okay. Like Soho uh, originally, a long time ago, uh, and, you know, and, and Bushwick and, and Williamsburg. East Williamsburg yeah. and, you know, in more, in more recent times. Um, you know, it, it, keeps, it keeps pushing, pushing further out, uh, you know, largely due to affordability, um, you know, but uh, I mean, listen, like, you know, I mean, Brooklyn, Brooklyn has, has been the most uh, over the past decade, uh, you know, the most, the most units built, I, I think each consecutive year. Uh, and I, I believe it's the fifth largest city in the United States right. unto itself. And, uh, you know, and, and Queens, my, you know, my native kind of humble Queens has really come up a heck of a lot Definitely. too with, uh, you know, with some, with some great neighborhoods and, um, you know, I mean, it is the most ethnically diverse place in, in our country, actually. I think there's more languages spoken there than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's a wealth of really diverse and interesting neighborhoods. And it's close to the city. I mean, like, you know, Long Island City, as I alluded to before, is, you know, 10 minutes out of midtown Manhattan. Astoria, too, by the way, is, is, is an amazing neighborhood right next door to Long Island City mm -hmm. that has been a lot of, a lot of development and, uh, and a wonderful place to live. Great. Okay. And Ron, we want to know about um, your company, Best in Partners. What, what do you kind of focus <clears throat> on and what do you do there? So um, Besson Partners is a middle market investment sales brokerage firm that is integrated with a few other services. Uh, we also do property management. We manage approximately 3,000 3, units throughout New York City. Uh, we have a very competent team uh, doing that. And uh, we also have uh, someone focused on distressed asset advisory as well, where we'll manage properties under receivership or in the foreclosure process uh, for for lenders and receivers. Um, so the company was started in 1988 by Michael Besson, who remains the president and CEO. Um, I run the investment sales division. And, uh, you know, we sell virtually all asset types, uh, historically mostly multifamily and mixed use, but also uh, development properties. Uh, we have sold office buildings too. Um, you know, smaller to mid-sized office properties. Uh, and in 2018, we actually started a hotel group uh, with a few gentlemen who uh, are absolutely terrific and uh, really, unfortunately, took their lumps during COVID as, as the sector really uh, got, got, got hit hard, but, uh, you know, kept, kept their heads down and really got to know uh, all the players in the industry and uh, are, are crushing it right now as, as, the, uh, as the sector has really come back and, you know, and is performing much better. Awesome. So. Great. And what do you think, um, for a young person, what do you think makes Besson such a special place to work? What separates? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, we're really a boutique kind of environment. So, uh, you know, you, you really have the opportunity to be very hands-on. Um, you keep what you originate um, as, it, as opposed to it, you know, being divvied up into 12 different pieces of the pie per se. Uh, you know, there's a lot of help and support uh, from myself as well as our terrific marketing and analyst team. And, uh, you know, we really kind of have more of a familial type of type of environment. It's not cutthroat. Everybody's rooting for each other. And, uh, you know, I also believe that the quality of our output and our marketing is bar none mm. and can hold up to JLL, Marcus, CB. Awesome. Uh, and name it. Great. Awesome. Great. Um, and I want to know how you kind of vet business partners and people you work with, what's a telling sign that you should or you shouldn't work with someone? <clears throat> well, I'd say for the purposes of context 
here for for brokerage, uh, partners for me would translate to really either sellers Clients. or or buyers, yeah. right? So you know, I mean. Client is is a word that I use judiciously as for people who have hired us uh, to to sell their real estate and we have a fiduciary to them, right? So, um, you know, the number one question I'm always asking and frankly is, you know, a daily mantra around our office is, do we have a real seller? That That's question number one. If If, if you have that, everything else ultimately falls into place, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, that comes down to motivation. And right now, uh, you know, there, there, is a, there is certainly a concern amongst potential sellers that it may not be a great time to sell, right? So that's always a, a, a challenge of how to answer that question. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality is, is they have to have a tangible reason. Mm. And right now that starts with loan maturity. Obviously everyone is focused on that and waiting for the big, you know, the big windfall in, in October when a lot of loan CMBS loans come, come due, uh, you know, but uh, certainly there are other reasons as well, right? Partnership dispute, a death, uh, you know, someone retiring mm. and just wanting to cash out their chips. Um, so, you know, asking the simple and innocuous question of why are you selling? is something that I certainly uh, try to teach all, all, our, all our people to do. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, it's not meant to be prying or personal, but it's really a, an important qualification question to get at people's motivations. And if someone, you know, it's, the reality is, is purely discretionary sellers are out of the market right mm. now. Mm. You gotta have a real reason. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I've, there have been assignments that I've turned away recently which I, I, I hate even saying that or thinking it because, uh, you know, who am I to turn away business, mm -hmm. right? But I really, all we have is our time, right? So uh, we have to be, be a little cautious now about, about how we use that. Okay. Um, also, just to, to, to talk about buyers on the, on, the, on the flip side of that, because, you know, it, it's an important part of our, our role to qualify those, those folks as well, right? So, you know, if it's someone who we're not familiar with, uh, you know, we, we have no qualms about asking them about uh, available liquidity. Uh, you know, do they have the cash or equity on hand to, you know, to, to be able to take down this, this transaction? Mm. Uh, in some cases, we'll ask for proof of funds. Uh, you know, and, and if, you know, we can't see what, what properties they own and it's not readily transparent. So qualifying buyers is also, a, frankly, an important part of our role and service to our sellers. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And let's say you're in a market right now where there aren't that many bo motivated buyers or sellers and everyone's kind of sitting on the sidelines. How do you make money in a down market like that? The cold hard truth is that you, you make less money in, you know, in, in down markets, right? Um, that said, good brokers make, make deals and, you know, and, and money in every market. Uh, you know, so, you know, everyone likes to have the shiny, happy answer to this question. Uh, you know, so it's like the, you know, what, what can you do today uh, to, you know, to, to, to be ready and, and build for tomorrow mm. a, a little bit. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to get discouraged when, you know, you, you come to your office, you sit down at your desk, particularly like if you're a new to business broker and, you know, you're, you're making your calls and, you know, by call, you know, number 42 or whatever, everyone is either said no or, uh, you know, or, or no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and it's like, well, geez, I'm banging my head against the wall. Why, why, why am I doing this? This is pointless, but it's not. Yeah, you, you got to lean in. Um, and the truth is you got to, you, you got to, you got to work harder. Mm -hmm. You got to not take your foot off the gas. You got to make more calls, send more emails and follow-ups, try to get out, get yourself out there to more events in front of people and, you know, have coffee with people mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just keep, keep it going because, you know, when, when the cycle does turn, it turns fairly quickly and you want to be ready for it. Okay, got it. And what do you look for in a new hire for Besson? Is it that tendency to kind of um, 
look at adversity and, and lean into it, as you said? Uh, I mean, for sure. Like I, you know, I, I, I really, uh, look for that in, in, in people. Um, I, I, you know, I, I look for people who are personable, have really sharp communication skills, who are likable, um, you know, and who also seem hungry to succeed right. and if you know, and, and ideally have some demonstrated inter interest in real estate. Um, you know, if it's someone coming out of college, if they had a leadership role in a real estate club, ideally, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had a ton of interns from Baruch. Okay. Shout out to Baruch. <laughs> um, amazing kids. Those kids are just hungry. Hustlers. They will work hard. Um, you know, and, and, uh, we've had several interns who, you know, who I'm still in touch with today and I, I love those kids. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a combination of things. Uh, I would say, you know, obviously intelligence, um, you know, people who, 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 who seem resilient, mm. you know, these, I guess these are recurring themes you're hearing from me. This is largely a personality driven business. So I really do look for a combination of both book smarts and street smarts. Um, and importantly, I really look for people who are coachable and who are willing to learn. Um, what's your favorite deal that you've worked on in your career so far? Well, there, there are certainly several, but I, I would have to say a ground lease at 167 to 171 Christie Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which I completed in 2017. Uh, and that took a little over two years of time to, to get done. Uh, it was uh, a, a longtime family that owned the property there uh, where they operated their beer distribution business. And the father had passed away and the mother and five children had reluctantly decided that they wanted to sell. Mm. They were really not real estate people uh, or particularly sophisticated. And uh, so, you know, it required a lot of careful handholding and communication along the way. Uh, so they hired myself and my former colleague at the time, Brian Belkin, mm. Uh, to represent them in the sale. And we got them a price of $34 million for the site, which worked out to $800 per buildable square foot. Wow. If you could believe that. Um, and this was like, you know, 2015, 2016 timing that that, that happened. And then they just pumped the brakes mm. and decided that they didn't want to sell uh, probably because they realized the capital gains taxes were going to be eight figures, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, we went home and uh, sulked for, for, <laughs> for a little bit and were sad. And like I said before, dusted our shoulders off and kept going. Uh, we certainly stayed in contact with them to see how things may have progressed always want to follow up, mm. very important. And uh, we learned that they shifted gears and opted to, to do a ground lease. And unfortunately, with somebody else. Mm. So, you know, we continued to track the deal. And uh, we learned that that deal fell through. And we got a call from one of the sons, who was a lovely guy, and very much a straight shooter which is also rare. Right. And he asked us if we could uh, come back to work on the deal and bring him somebody else. And that's exactly what we did. We brought back our original developer uh, who was game to do a ground lease structure. And over the course of the next probably five months or so, we, uh, we, we worked out a 99-year a, a ground lease with an aggregate value of 175 million. Wow. And uh, and now today there are two magnificent luxury rental buildings built on the site, uh, one of which was actually sold to Hub last year for 63 oh, wow. million. Okay, great. 
So uh, that was that was a, a doozy. <laughs> okay. And um, how? What strategies? Creative strategies that you kind of employ where you kind of thought out of the box to put this together? Was there anything you did specifically? Um, you know, I mean, I I think for one, just the you know the the, the shift from sale to ground lease was uh, you know was. I don't know how creative it is because it's not it's not that uncommon, mm. but it was certainly a you know a, a strategic decision that uh, you know that that worked out I think very well for all parties. Um, you know I, I think some of the creativity might have came into play just in in our communications with various family members right. and uh, you know and and a, and a matriarch who ruled with an iron fist. Right, <laughs> definitely. And I would imagine at that at this level, um, the hardest part is kind of managing the personalities and the egos that go with this, the the large real estate transactions. How do you kind of go about um, managing that and making sure that everyone gets the closing table correctly? Uh, I, I consider that to be one of one of my strongest skill sets. Okay. is managing difficult personalities. Okay. I've I've done it my entire life in my personal life. <laughs> And, you know, and my professional life, uh, you know, in my former career in advertising, I was kind of brought in as the, the turnaround guy when an account was going sour because of the relationship. Okay. Uh, and, you know, so, so to me, um, you know, that, that is the essence of, 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 of what I do. And as an intermediary and a service provider, it's, it's, a, it's a critical skill. Um, you know, to keep everyone calm and on the same track and informed uh, so as to not not have any, anything explode on you. I got a I got a I got an angry email this morning from a client uh, saying, Ron, what what is the deal with this with this with this buyer? Right. You know, he's he's supposed to close. I'm going to put this thing back on the market already. What's going on? Mm. Uh, and you know, you have to, you have to reply calmly to that. And I, you know, reminded him that of, of a couple of things, uh, and, you know, and, and calm, calmed him down, but it, it's largely about communication and mm. just managing expectations mm. and getting in front of it. Um, you know, one of my little, little secret, secret sauces is to get to them before they get to you. In other words, you know, communicate what's happening to them frequently mm. before they start to wonder and get pissed off. Mm. Because by the time they come back to you and say, hey, what's going on? They're annoyed. So, you, you know, if, if you're proactive, you can avoid that happening. Got it. So would you say it's a good strategy just to kind of deliver bad news to them um, in the correct way before they kind of find out behind, you know, around the transaction around you 100% be straight with people okay. even if you know when you even when you have to tell them bad stuff that's that's a you know that's a critical part of of what we do and you know you got to you got to be forthright about it and uh, you know even if even if they take your skin off mm -hmm. you got to you got to absorb it and just you know play it straight with with clients very right. important Okay. Um, and speaking of bad stuff, how important are politics in the real estate game and how do they kind of affect your job and um, any real estate entrepreneur, their yeah. future career? Yeah. Listen, politics are undeniably important, right? I mean, and, and that, that has, uh, you know, driv driven a lot of the, you know, the, the, the real estate dynamics in, in, in our wonderful city of New York. Um, you know, there there have been a number of things that, uh, you know, it, it just, it has been a source of frustration, right? Because uh, it just, it often feels like our local politicians can't get out of their own way to, uh, to, to affect some common sense legislation, uh, you know, certainly in the context of uh, more affordable housing development, which yeah. is, you know, just, just a, a critical issue in, in our city. Um, you know, it's just 421A, uh, sunsetting and not being replaced, uh, is, is, is an obvious one that, that we all talk about. 
uh, HSTPA in 2019. Uh, I'm sure everyone's talked talk that one blue in the face, yeah. so I won't go long on it. Um, but, you know, it's just that's obviously kind of backfired in, in some senses. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Uh, to, to preserve affordable housing for, for New Yorkers. Um, you know, yet landlords are not nonprofit businesses, right? So, uh, you know, they, they, you know, expenses are rising at a, at a higher rate than rents are. So, you know, it's, it's not complicated math. Mm. Um, you know, unfortunately, the result of that has been 50,000 or so units have just been taken out of circulation because the economics just don't work to renovate and improve those apartments and re-rent them. Yeah. Plain and simple. So um, it's it's really tough. And you know what's also crazy is that in a city of eight million people, one single person council member can kill an important and sizable development deal. Right. Look at uh, Innovation Queens in Astoria recently. Uh, Thirty two hundred units, mixed use development, uh, an incredible project. Uh, sponsored in part by an old friend of mine who's at Bedrock Partners, uh, you know, took, took a long time and a big, big tussle over percentage of affordable units there. And, you know, and finally, uh, given a little bit of help from the Queensborough president and, you know, and our mayor who appears to be pro-development and common sense, uh, got it through, right? Um, or look at 145, uh, in in Harlem, uh, 915 unit development, uh, you know that that was a crazy situation. That they they got to 50 percent affordable composition, and still wasn't good enough. Mm. So uh, you know, luckily there's there's a new sheriff in town uh, for that district, Yusuf Salam. Who does who who has openly stated that he is pro that development? development. So my hope is that uh, Bruce Teitelbaum does come back to the table and uh, and and build that because I think it'll be amazing and um, it's just it's it would it would be it would be a big loss to 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 not have that. Okay, got it. Um, Okay. And I want to ask, um, so as a broker, you kind of see a lot of different operators and investors. What are some unconventional or out of the box value as strategies that you've seen? Hmm. Um, well, <laughs> you know, I'll tell, I'll tell you one that actually, um, has been very prevalent. That is an answer you might not expect, which is in the limited service hotel segment, where you know the the massive influx of uh, you know of, of 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 you know migrants into into New York City, as well as the un unfortunate high population of of homeless folks, um, has has spawned a lot of those uh, you know those those properties to convert into transitional housing mm -hmm. or or shelters, um, which has been very, very lucrative for, uh, you know, for, for some of those owners and operators, um, you know, and so that's, you know, after, after sucking wind for a little while in the, in the pandemic, right. uh, a, a number of those, uh, owners have really recouped some, some serious revenue, uh, through, through that, through that channel. Um, you know, otherwise, I mean, you know, there's the uh, you know assembling apartments to to reset first rents. Uh, you know, I mean, out, out of the box. I mean, I don't know how much how much more is out of the box per se. You know, yeah, office office conversions obviously is a, is is a hot topic right now. Uh, you know, but much easier said than done right. on that. And um, with office conversions, what do you think would be the most effective conversion? Um, so, you know, that's, that is certainly in like a, you know, one size does not fit all answer. Right. It really d depends on, you know, on the asset and the location. 
you know, everyone is talking about it, but the, you know, the, the reality is, is that it's, it, it's a heavy lift, uh, you know, certainly from a, from a construction standpoint and, and, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of office assets, particularly if they're mid block, um, you know, only have light and air on two sides, which makes it, makes it a little bit challenging. Um, you know, I, I recently sold what was an office property uh, at 112 4th Avenue, just south of Union Square. Uh, you know, a certificate of occupancy was office upstairs over, over retail, mm -hmm. uh, sold it to a very active value add uh, rental uh, investor and operator who is converting the upper floors to, uh, to, to, to residential. And what they're doing is, is they're basically um, subdividing each floor into two units uh, because the, the, the light and air on, on each side is actually pr pretty terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're like 13 foot ceiling heights. So they're, they're, they're gonna transform that into incredible loft style right. apartment units. Um, so I, I'm look fo looking forward to seeing the, the end product there. Awesome. Great. Um, and I want to know what drives you nowadays. Is it money, personal achievement, family, or philanthropy? Um, honestly, it's, I, I would say it's just, uh, well-being in, in, in totality. Uh, you know, as you, as you get a little older, you really do come to appreciate what's, what's more important in life which is family, friends, and, and good health. Um, you know, I mean, sure, we all, we all like money and the nice things that, that, that it can buy and, and it's, a, it's a means to an end. Um, you know, but listen, if you don't have family, friends, and health, what's it good for? Mm. So, you know, uh, I, through the pandemic, I, you know, I, I started to, to do a couple more things uh, for myself, just in terms of self-care mm. to keep my head on straight, you know, like little meditation, amped up the exercise, uh, you know, just talking to talking to family and friends more frequently. And, uh, you know, that's that's really what matters the most to me. Great. Awesome. And, and just being a good person and, you know, and and uh, raising good, good, healthy, happy children. Awesome. Great. Um, and Ron, I have my final question to wrap this up. What advice would you give your 22 year old self about life, business and relationships? So one, it's okay to make mistakes and fail so long as you pick yourself back up and keep going Two, be open to new ideas. Never stop learning. Three, put in the time and effort to develop an expertise Four. Relationships are everything. Never burn bridges. Mm. And last, but certainly not least, travel to interesting and faraway places. It makes you a far worldlier and interesting person. Awesome. Ron, thank you so much again for doing this. I really appreciate it.